You cannot be the product of a mechanical and meaningless universe. Figs do not grow on thistles. Grapes do not grow on thorns. And therefore, you, as an expression of the universe, as an aperture through which the universe is observing itself, cannot be a mere fluke. Because if this world peoples as a tree brings forth fruit, then the universe itself, the energy which underlies it, what it's all about, the ground of being, as Paul Tillich called it, must be intelligent. Now, when you come to that conclusion, you must be very careful because you may make an unwarranted jump, namely the jump to the conclusion that that intelligence, that marvelous designing power which produces all this is the biblical God. Be careful. Because that God is fashioned in the graven image of a paternal, authoritarian, contrary to his own commandment is fashioned in the graven image of a paternal, authoritarian, beneficent tyrant of the ancient Near East. You see, when you ask, how do I attain the knowledge of God? How do I attain nirvana, liberation? All I can say is it's the wrong question. Why do you want to attain it? Because the very fact that you're wanting to attain it is the only thing that prevents you from getting that. You already have it. But of course, yeah, uh, it's it's up to you. It's your privilege to pretend that you don't. Hey, that's your life game. That's what makes you think you're an ego. And uh, when you want to wake up, you will, just like that. If you're not awake, it shows you don't want to. You're you're still playing the hide part of the game. You're still, as it were, the 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 self, pretending it's not the self. That's what you want to do. So you see, in that way too, you're already there. So you, when you understand this, a funny thing happens, and some people. Uh, misinterpret it. You will discover as this happens that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary behavior disappears. You will realize that what you describe as things under your own will feel exactly the same as things going on outside you. You watch other people moving and you know you're doing that, just like you're breathing or circulating your blood. If you don't understand what's going on, you're liable to get crazy at this point. And to feel that you are God in the Jehovah sense, say that you actually have power over other people, so that you could alter what they're doing, and that you are omnipotent in a very crude, literal kind of Bible sense. See, and uh, a lot of people feel that, and they go crazy. They have to put them away. They think they're Jesus Christ, and that everybody ought to fall down and worship. That's only they got their wires crossed. This experience happened to them, but they don't know how to interpret it. So be careful of that. Jung calls it inflation. Uh, people who get the holy man syndrome that uh, I suddenly discovered that I'm the Lord and that I'm above good and evil and so on, and that, that uh, therefore I start giving myself airs and graces. But the point is, everybody else is too. If you discover that you're that, then you ought to know that everybody else is. And what a beautiful world it is we live in, although at some times it might feel a little strange and challenging. Um, welcome back to the channel and I hope all my subs are doing well and welcome to any new subs who've joined the channel and if you're a visitor I also appreciate your being here. Uh, in this video I'm going to be talking about the number 69 which is one of the halves of the 138 so 69 times 2 being 138, um, the yin and the yang, the singularity, the alpha and the omega. And I'm going to talk about um, mythological um, deities and goddesses and, and all that type of thing. So I'm going to start off by talking about Inanna, who is among the oldest deities, whose names are recorded in um, ancient Sumer. And she's listed among the earliest seven divine powers. And these seven would form the basis for many of the characteristics of the gods who followed. The most important gods of the Sumerian pantheon include An, the god of heaven, Enlil, the storm and wind god, Enki, the water god, Ninhursag, the goddess of fertility and the earth, and Utu, the god of justice and of the sun and his father, Nana, god of the moon. So Utu of Sumer, also known as Shamash, 
in later Babylonian is the Sumerian god of the sun and divine justice. He's the son of the moon god. He was believed to have appeared to Zaya Sudra of Shurupak. Shurupak, who was listed uh, in the Sumerian king list as the last king of Sumer prior to the Great Flood. Shamash appeared after the Great Flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Shamash was regarded as the god of justice and governor of the universe. His symbol of the solar disk shows a circle with four points protruding towards the cardinal directions and four wavy lines emanating diagonally outward from between them. And Shamash was not only the bringer of light, but the arbiter of justice. And Sin, he was one of the first gods, and this was one of several names he had. Secondly, he, he has a main, major moon god that was incorporated within the city-state cultures of the Mesopotamian area. And initially, he was the father of Shamash and Ishtar, the sun god and the goddess of war and sexual love. And Shamash, Ishtar and Sin came to represent the triad of astral deities. And Mesopotamian texts recorded that Ishtar was the twin sister of Shamash and the younger sister of Ereshkigal, the goddess of the underworld. And Sin was not only the name he went by. The, uh, the Akkadians, Sumerians, Hittites, Babylonian, Mitanni and Assyrians, among others, had uh, varied names for this god, and they include Nana, Suen, and Sin. And Nana represented the full moon. Sin represented the crescent moon, and Asim Baba represented uh, the beginning of each cycle. And the interesting thing about these deities, um, these these moon gods and, and, and the sun god as well, so Shamash equals 69 in ordinal, and Asim Baba also equals 69 in ordinal. And the AI god equals 69 in ordinal, and Venom equals 69 in ordinal. And if you type the AI god Shamash, it equals 138. And Samael, or Samael, means venom or poison of God. Samael is an archangel in Talmudic and post-Talmudic lore. He's a figure who is the accuser or adversary, Satan in the book of Job, seducer and destroying angel in the book of Exodus. And the symbol of this moon god, the crescent moon, didn't come into uh, existence with the Ottoman Turks. It was uh, constantly found on ancient pottery or artifacts of worship, and it has been shown that the worship of the moon god, Suwen, also called Nana or Simbaba, was the most widespread. And aside from the names, Sin had several distinctive descriptions, while some parts varied among Mesopotamian culture, there were uh, several traits that they shared. Some of them are as follows. Okay, he was depicted as a hermaphrodite and had a lunar halo or crescent shaped moon around his head. He was sometimes depicted or associated with an ox, um, and he was often described or seen working in accordance with the sun, which happens to be his son. And Sin represented feminine energy. His role symbolized fertility while the bull ox symbols uh, represented mas masculine strength. And his representation as being both genders may be the most confounding, but it was not unusual for ancient gods to possess both male and female attributes. And this will be evident by the end of this. Um, according to the second chapter of Genesis, Eve was created by God, Yahweh, by taking her from the rib of Adam to be Adam's companion. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Okay, now the word used in Hebrew um, is tzela, which means, it actually means side, not rib. The word refers to the whole side of a bilaterally symmetrical object. If the word was tzela by itself, the most appropriate translation would be side. Uh, it's a mathematical term meaning the side um, of a triangle or square. Uh, in the descriptions of the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, we see uh, that the term cellar 
is used to describe the entire side of the ark. The woman is made of Adam's bone and Adam's flesh, okay, not just the bone. It may also be worth um, remembering that in Hebrew, masculine gender applies to any mixed group containing males and females. So referring to Adam with masculine um, verbs can also fit the hypothesis that Adam contained both male and female halves within him. And God originally created Adam as a hermaphrodite, bodily uh, and spiritually, both male and female, before creating and the separate beings of Adam and Eve. And this is, in my opinion, the allegory of the splitting of the Adam. And when we look at all of these gods um, that have been shown to us throughout history, statues and images that have been created, okay, one thing that's strikingly obvious is that to me it looks like the same person, okay, whether it be a male or a female. So Hera, the wife of Zeus, as you can see here, has in this image quite a masculine looking face, a young masculine looking face. And in the image here, she has more more of a feminine look. She has feminine attire. She's wearing a headpiece and a veil and this, that, and the other. And then below is Zeus himself. Um, and in the next image is Hades. Okay. And as you can see, he's holding a rod or a staff. Okay. Um, in the next image, we have Poseidon who is also holding or should have been holding something, perhaps that has been removed uh, for some reason. Um, and also in this image here of Zeus, um, or I believe is Zeus, he's standing on a platform and on the platform is written in Latin uh, three and one. Um, so you have the three and one, Zeus, Hades and Poseidon. Okay, so representing the three that are all the same people, they're the same. Okay, so Alexander the Great, here we have uh, the head of Alexander the Great, and he always has the horns of Zeus Amon, which refer to Alexander's claim to be the son of uh, the Egyptian god Amon. And this one um, was made around 300 BC, and it comes from uh, Cairo and made from marble and traces of red color in the hair and the face and whatnot and it's been damaged as you can see but that's a very nice that's a very feminine uh depiction and the next one we have is uh dionysus again if you look at the faces of these these carvings of these statues they all look very very alike i mean they look like the same person and apollo here in this one uh, I don't really want to say exactly what I'm seeing here. I think if you look closely, you can see that the anatomy of this person is not what we're kind of used to. This is um, this is the male and the female together in one. Okay, so it's it's clearly evident. And in the next one, this is Apollo. I mean, just looking at the face, that's what I'm showing here is these all of these images of these um, these mythological gods, Apollo. Um, the next one is Artemis, Apollo's twin sister. They all happen to have twins as well, either a twin brother or a twin sister. Um, and then we have Diana, the Roman goddess, a.k.a. Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Okay, and you can see they're pulling her, um, her arrows out of her... Um, or quiver that she's carrying on her back. Um, also, quite a masculine looking face and built looking woman. Not not overly muscular, but built enough. And in this photo below this image, um, this image I found online as well. And as you can see, there's uh, these two little beings that have been tied up around the neck and they have these little antlers sticking out and depicting Diablo, you know. Anyhow, so the next one is Medusa. And as I'm going through these, just the main point in me showing these is to show the similarities between the faces of but all of these 
all of these gods um, and deities. So Medusa, uh, there's Selene. We've got Selene here with the crescent moon on her head, which depicts these horns. Um, and the next one uh, is Media. Media as well has a very masculine uh, appearance to the face and is adorned in quite uh, beautiful clothing. The next one is the Statue of Liberty. Okay, so again, I mean, if you just look at all of their faces, they look to be the same person. And Zeus is the Greek equivalent of Anu, the sky father, king of the gods. And if we look at Eliphas Levi's depiction of Baphomet, he's um, drawing him pointing up and down. So he's pointing an eclipse sun and a uh, crescent moon. And on his arms he has engraved um, solve et coagula, which means to, uh, to dissolve and coagulate. So it's basically um, to, to separate and join together. It's a medieval alchemy quote, which is to say that nothing new can be built um, if not before we make space, destroying the old. So we came out of the water, which is truth. And when we arrived at the dock, we were considered dead or lost at sea, lost in truth. So the fictional characters of you and I uh, were given liberty to operate in within the construct, to work, to pay bills, and to by choice, become indoctrinated and to become attached to the materialistic nature of this realm, um, to become attached to everything that is essentially outside of ourselves. And the interesting thing here is that hippocampus means seahorse, um, hippocampus region of the brain that is associated primarily with memory. The name hippocampus is derived from the Greek hippocampus, hippos meaning horse, and kampos, meaning sea monster, since the structure's shape resembles that of a seahorse. And the white horse is the pegasus. So the functions of memory are carried out by the hippocampus and other related structures in the temporal lobe. And mem is believed to uh, derive from the Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol for water, which has been simplified by the Phoenicians and named after their word for water. Uh, mem ultimately coming from the proto-Semitic May. And the hippocampus is also known as Ammon's horn because the C-shaped coronal section of hippocampus is uh, resembles the ram's horn. And the term Ammon's horn is derived from the Egyptian deity with ram's head. So the horns of Ammon are depicting the hippocampus. So we came from the truth. The truth is within us. The truth is who we are. As far back as we can go, it's the same story being played over and over, with the same character playing as the adversary. And perhaps we are the ones who wrote the story and wrote the script to fool ourselves and to test ourselves, because I think we've come here to experience everything of that which we are not and to remember who we truly are, divine, immortal souls that need not fear, or to search outside ourselves for a saviour, because salvation comes from within, 